Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the fortnightly IAB webinar. Uh, particular warm welcome to our our friends in in Melbourne um, this morning. We're we're thinking of thinking of you all. Um, about nine months ago, we ran a gaming and esports um, webinar pretty early on into the to the lockdown, um, talking about the growth in consumption and and highlighting the growth of the gaming industry. Um, and nine months later, we thought it was worthwhile to to revisit this sector. There's been so much interest and so much growth in the space over the last over the last year, let alone the last sort of five years. So we thought it was absolutely time to revisit. Off the back of the webinar, there was so much interest into this area. We actually established a gaming working group, uh, which many of the people joining us today are proud members of. So there's a lot of work in the background that the IAB over the next year will be bringing you in this space. Um, the group's got some pretty pretty exciting projects on, on the boil. Um, if you want to get to know that gaming working group, they put out a, a lovely infographic, a Mythbuster infographic uh, with some personal and industry myth busting. Um, so I would, I would recommend Tiff will share the link to that infographic in the background. If for no other reason, click through and have a look at our wonderful tech lead, um, JJ, who many of you will know, and his wonderful moustache and sunglasses. So. Um, if the content doesn't get you, the, um, the glamour of JJ's picture will, hopefully. Um, as I said, since, since that last webinar, we've seen consumption increase across all platforms and a lot of the consumption, the, the uplifting consumption that we saw during lockdown continue and actually grow on top of that. So from a consumer point of view, we've seen growth, but as importantly for this, um, for this crowd, the industry side of things has had a lot of development. So interest from brands, agencies, wanting to try new things, wanting to explore new areas and actually going past exploring. I think that's an important thing that we'll look at today, going beyond test and learn and actually having it as a, um, and it's a tricky thing with gaming because it's so many different things, whether it's a, a channel, but the myriad of options and actually taking it to a level that's proving value, giving proof points, showing the impact, and hopefully we can share some really great examples of that to get you inspired, um, both from a creative point of view and from a business point of view today. Um, so let me introduce you to who we have lined up today, and you can see some of their faces on the, on the screen here, uh, but a great lineup of speakers. The way we're gonna um, roll today is we're gonna set up the scene and the market and understand a little bit more about the Australian gamer with Andrea Churilla from Cantor, who's very kindly um, providing us with a brand new cut of data on the Australian market. So some, some nice fresh stats and, and information for you all. Um, Andrea's gonna be followed by Ricky Chanana from Twitch, who's gonna show some um, two brilliant Australian case studies, um, highlighting creative, but also, as I said, impact. And then we're going to go into a, a panel discussion um, moderated by Poppy Hill, who's, who's the chair of our gaming working group. Uh, and she'll be joined again by Ricky, as well as Lance uh, Traore from Ad Colony and Ash Ringrose from SNG Studio. Um, so we've got lots of information for you um, coming through today. Um, I am going to hand over in a minute, but if you have questions throughout the webinar, we would love to hear from you. We will get to them at the end of the panel, but please pop them in the Q&A box. Um, we would love to, love to address as many of those as we can. Um, if you want to call out to anyone, there's also a chat box. If you want to just give anyone a shout out, um, that's there as well. So please, please feel free to stay engaged. The recording of this webinar will be sent out. You'll send. You'll receive a link probably next Tuesday um, with the with the recording and any of the the decks that we can share. So, without further to do, um, I will hand over to Andrea, who is going to take us through some um, brand new research. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. So, in this part of the webinar, I will take you through acted at a global level um, and this will hopefully give you a glimpse uh, into the gaming market in Australia. So the study is called uh, TGI Global Quick View. Move to the next slide. Yep. 
So the study is called PGI Global Quick View. Um, and in essence, uh, this is a survey-based audience profiling tool that enables brands, agencies, and media owners alike to complement the targeting of consumers across multiple markets with in-depth localized targeting and planning. Uh, so in other words, this uh, type of study will help profile our consumers of interest and understand where we best can find them. Um, just quickly, this tool comprises consumer data that covers three key areas. Uh, online personality traits, so here we're looking at the different user types like e-commerce user or social media user. Online media preferences, um, looking at the way uh, consumers consumers um, engage with the different media platforms like video or audio streaming habits. And last but not least, online brand and purchase preferences. So here looking at how our consumers um, purchase different brands or products and what their preference reasons are. And if you want to find out more about this tool, you can go on our website and see the variety of different studies done through PGI Global Quick View. But obviously today we'll focus on gaming. So um, we employ this tool specifically just to find out the latest trends on gaming. Uh, and this particular piece of research was conducted between March and May 2021. So it's very hot off the press data that we're having through this tool now. Uh, the location was across 25 countries around the world, including Asia Pacific, Europe and the Americas. And the sample that was used um, was internet using adults. And for Australia specific, we managed to get 2,251 internet users, which is a pretty robust sample for the markets. Now, to begin with, one of the first questions that we obviously wanted to address relates to the proportion of video gamers in Australia amongst internet users. Um, and as you can tell on the chart here, marked in the pink red color, uh, we have just over half of Australian market internet users also stating that they play games. So 52% internet users are gamers in Australia. Uh, this is similar to other markets like Sweden, Japan and Netherlands. But when we put it into perspective of other markets like say Indonesia, Taiwan, or India, it is fair to say that there is some headroom to still grow in this industry uh, further, making it a great opportunity for Australia to continue to expand um, in this area. As we know, it's, it's done over the last few years. So now in the next section, we're going to explore and understand what our typical Australian gamer is based on a variety of variables, things like age, gender, devices that they might be using, uh, or activities more, like, more likely to engage with. Um, one of the interesting learnings that came out of this study is that we, it's actually time that we forget the outdated gamer um, stereotypes. So the gamer today is not that moody teenager in a darkened room playing uh, on the consoles all hours in a day. Um, in actual fact, if we're talking about devices, it is the smartphones that uh, lead the way. Um, and this is in line with what is seen globally as well. Um, in Australia, this is followed by consoles uh, and desktop or laptops. Interesting to note that um, in Australia, consoles are a little bit more popular than around the world. So as you'll see there on the chart on the bottom, 45% of our gamers uh, use consoles, uh, which is ahead of what is seen uh, globally. But um, no doubt smartphones definitely lead the way in the world of gaming. Now, if you look on the right hand side of this slide, um, we will have um, uh, an idea of what our age groups are in terms of gamers. So we see that our largest proportion of gamers lie amongst the younger of 16 to 44. However, we do see gamers across all age groups, um, contrary to what we might have believed a few years ago. Uh, and 41% of the gamers in Australia are also female. So definitely time to forget those outdated gamer stereotypes. And moving on to dig even deeper into the gaming profile, the study also shows that our gamers are also more likely to engage in a variety of different online activities, which is perhaps not completely unexpected. 
things like gambling, online dating, or watching Netflix um, are some of those online activities where they're more likely to be present as well. But if we were to pick the top ones, our Australian gamer is 34% more likely than the average Australian to rent or buy movies or shows and to use the voice activated personal assistant as a search function. Furthermore, on to the next slide. The study also shows that Australia is in line with the rest of the world in terms of proportion of heavy gamers. Um, and here I should pause and define what a heavy gamer is. So basically it's anyone playing for more than five hours in a day. And if we have a look on the left-hand side chart there, we'll see that 10% of our gamers in Australia uh, fall within that category of heavy gamers. Um, which uh, is in line with what we also see on average globally, uh, showing that there is definitely a high affinity for gaming in Australia. Now, given the landscape of the pandemic um, over, the, uh, over the last few months and the various changes that the pandemic brought across a range of different industries, this study also wanted to capture the effect of the pandemic on gaming. And the question that we asked here was, um, it's listed there on the right-hand side, due to the coronavirus pandemic, have you already changed or do you think you will change um, any of the following habits, gaming being one of them? And then as you'll tell on the chart on the left-hand side, 35% of our Aussies game, Aussie gamers mentioned that their behavior changed and only 8% expect this new behavior to shift again um, anytime soon. Uh, and this is not very far from the global average, um, despite the fact that in Australia, the restrictions have not been as strict as in other parts of the world, like in Spain, where we see um, the, the gaming behavior changing at a significant degree, 49%. And it's even higher than other countries like um, Sweden. So despite the fact that we don't have an exact indication as to whether this change represents an increase or a decrease, um, I think given the more recent developments in terms of online consumption um, and, and some, of, um, some of the other developments that um, we, we heard about uh, at the beginning of this webinar, it is safe to assume that we can expect an uptake in the gaming industry uh, to continue over the next few months. So definitely, um, lots of changes happening in the gaming industry and the pandemic has definitely um, provoked some of them. And just to finish off this piece of research with a few stats on some of the most popular choices amongst our gamers, we see PlayStation as the most popular choice of network. However, interesting to see how much of an advantage a uh, mobile gaming network has globally. Um, this is something that perhaps Australia can do some, cap some catch up on. And last but not least, our top five games in Australia, Call of Duty, uh, Candy Crush, FIFA, Mario Kart, and Minecraft. Um, and this is broadly in line with what we saw globally as well. Although in some particular markets, we might see some shifts uh, based on some cultural preferences. And to summarize some of the key takeouts based on this research, um, one, while the gaming in Australia is um, a popular choice of activity, there's definitely some headroom to grow further in the industry. And we definitely need to forget about those classic stereotypical gamer. Our target audience today encompasses both men and women of all ages. And the best environments where we can find these uh, audiences um, are basically other platforms dedicated to online activities, such as renting or buying movies or shows online, online dating and gambling amongst some of the top ones. And last but not least, the coronavirus pandemic has changed gaming behavior in Australia in a very short space of time, despite limited restrictions compared to the rest of the world. And that behavior is not going to change anytime soon. Uh, a very strong indicator of an uptake in the gaming industry in Australia. Thank you very much. I will now hand over to Ricky from Switch. 
Thank you, Andrea. It was great. Uh, really good to get an understanding of from Cantar about the AU landscape of gaming. It's always good to have a third and independent eye to it. So thank you for that. Welcome everyone. I was just looking at the people on the on, on the um, on the webinar, some really friendly faces. Jane Sayer, Roger Dunn, always the case, isn't it? So welcome all. Um, hopefully today we'll give you guys a really interesting perspective of where we were last year, as Gay mentioned. Um, when we presented to you guys uh, 11 months ago to where we are, it's a positive story and, you know, and individual businesses you'll hear from us. It's such a big growth. It's been a such an incredible journey and we continue to see some big numbers come out. I'm hoping uh, most of you guys can hear me properly. Can someone just give me on the chat? You guys can hear me properly, so I'll just continue. All good, Ricky. All good. Amazing. Awesome. All righty. Okay. So what I'm going to present you guys today, a couple is, is as uh, Gay kind of opened up a couple of case studies of uh, clients, which we have, uh, you know, done some amazing work. Why these two case studies outside the others? Because both these clients are not gaming. And I think this is where you will probably hear a lot from us, from myself, from Gay, from Poppy and Andrea and Lance as well, and Ash hopefully later on, that you know, gaming is not just about for gaming clients or perhaps you know, the niche category, gaming is mainstream. Yep, your friends, your cousins, your families, your brothers, your sisters, they're all gamers in some shape or capacity, and you hear a lot about it. So let's get cracking on the first case study, which is actually one of my favorite ones. Um, so um, even uh, Gay mentioned this is actually, she quite liked this case study. This is a Audible case study where um, uh, it's actually been a quite a success for us. So Audible came to us and saying, look, you guys obviously do a lot of work with the content creators or audio visual. We are a, a audio led business where, you know, uh, the, the whole premises of Audible is you can actually have audio books. How do we use and leverage your uh, service and your platform to drive an awareness about us, which is all about, you know, a, a, a audio kind of a listening book. We came up with the idea of Audio Light Club. It was such a great success and you'll hear about it. Um, bit, bit of a caveat early on. This campaign was such a great success that we, uh, the business internally decided to do a voiceover of an American one because they wanted to roll this out globally. Uh, apparently, the feedback from um, a couple of Americans is we can be a bit sharp in our accent. So we decided to use a, a bit more subtle American accent, perhaps, to do this case study. So, um, Gay, do you want to play that? And we'll talk about it a little bit second after this. Good, very badly. Twitch is home to 1.5 billion hours of live video content every month and an audience that loves good storytelling and entertainment. So how do you introduce this video-loving audience to the thrills of audio storytelling from Audible? By doing what Twitch does best and creating a community out of what some might deem a solo act. Video games. Oh, Jesus. Introducing the first ever Audible Live Club, taking the idea of a book club and making it modern and live on Twitch. Helping Audible transform audiobook and podcast listening from a solo activity to an Hello, interactive buddy. community experience on Twitch. I'm not ready for that to be over. Bajo kicked off the Audible Live Club with Nut Jobs, an Audible original podcast, narrated by Australian TV presenter Mark Fennell. Credits to download audiobooks were given out during the stream. To top it off, Audible Australia launched its first ever Audible Emote. Aww. At Christmas, Twitch streamers I Am Fall From Grace and Reefs thrilled fans with a live reading of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol with a twist, taking on creative cues from the Twitch community. Oh my god! I love you, Chad. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Super fun! Audible Live Club generated headlines and social buzz as it took off beyond Twitch. The results? Awesome! The campaign caught global attention as people around the world joined in the fun. With overwhelming requests for the next Audible Live Club stream, it looks like the Audible community party only just got started. I think there's a slight lag in the video, but I think you guys got the drip. You know, really good uh, campaign for us to, to drive a you know, a, perhaps a interesting tech on a, on a platform, which using the content creators to actually do an audio live club, you know, and using their gaming uh, um, ecosystem to really do something really interesting about it. Um, you know, the, the results are here. Um, I'm sure, you know, uh, the, you know, the increasing brand call and all those are, you know, the, 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 the life and butters of a lot of clients want, but what we were really good about it, this is an ongoing thing, which we'll love to continue working with the clients perhaps this year as well. Um, if you go to the next slide from here, 
you know, I'm sure you guys probably heard about Choose in New Zealand. Um, you know, we I presented this initially last year as uh, uh, when we were working on this campaign, we were really proud. And this time around, we've done a whole case study on it on the video. So again, I'll get Gay to just play the video and we'll come back um, to the slides again. Dude, I want to visit this place so bad. It looks cool. It looks like Death Stranding. What? Holy, that's a lot of subs. Chat. Oh my god. Play in Zed. Play in Zed. <laughs> you can actually kind of see like the curvature, like the, the landscape of the country, the coast of the country. That's pretty crazy. That's so pretty. <gasps> Wonder if there's a secret cave under that waterfall. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> Thank you so much! That is bloody enormous! Holy hell! Oh, oh, I clicked on the thing. I got excited. Right. Look, we are really proud about this campaign. Obviously, this you know it was a wild idea back in pandemic when international travel was kind of uh, only you can think about it. Uh, you know, I remember Gay asking the question to Andrew Waddell, who is the uh, the MD of uh, Tourism New Zealand. How did your CFO approve, approve this campaign? And you know, he said, you know, using a really authentic content creator is in the world of gamers to keep. Tourism keep traveling top of mind is a unique way when when the borders open and you know they're reaping in the benefits. We've done such a good job of the transcends and bubble at the moment. And from what I'm hearing from Andrew as anecdotes, they're seeing some great results come out and they've got plenty of Aussies going traveling to, to New Zealand, given the rest of the world is still shut for us. And you know, some great results there, as you can see. Um, I want to just quickly talk about two very interesting points before I pass it on to the panel, which I'm sure you guys are eagerly waiting to hear from everyone else, is the rise of esports. I'm sure this is not a term which is alien to you all on the session today. You're going to continue hearing. It's actually going to become even bigger. I always use this tagline and I always say that esports is as competitive as it gets. It's nothing different watching LeBron James play in the NBA or perhaps Tom Brady in the NFL. These guys have fan clubs. They get salaries in north of seven digit figures, US dollars. They're young, they're smart, they're talented, and they're coming in bucket loads to create a huge competitive fastest growing category around the world. I've compared a couple of stats here in terms of esports in Australia compared to the grassroots NFL and the ARL, and you can see clearly it's actually continuously growing. 73% more revenue than AFL, 159% more revenue than NRL. When I talk about revenue, that's coming from sponsorships, that's coming from advertising, that's coming from alignment, and that's coming from also tickets to watch the esports. So it's a huge contingency, and we're going to continue to keep growing in, in that sector. If you go next slide from here, some of you guys go, Rick, fair enough, you're talking a lot about esports, but why is the case is constantly growing compared to the grassroots? The reason for that is the variety and diversity of games being introduced every single year. So if I just bring your attention to the left side of the graph here, as you can see, 4,207 games were released in 2016. Fast forward one year, 7,000. That's a huge increase in 2018, 950. I know we're waiting for the latest stats to come out, but that number is past 2,100. When you have such a big variety, you are catering a lot of audience. If that is first person shooting, if that is role playing game, if that is even Jess, you know, Queen Gambit on Netflix when got uh, uh, released last year, we saw a huge increase of people playing esports around chess and the competitor and the spectatorship. So it is mainstream, it's pop culture and constantly going. 
And the next slide also just to justify, you know, why esports from a punter, from a consumer, from a user perspective is growing. And this is the feedback we get from our users all the time when we speak to them. They think esports is more strategic. It actually has a lot more um, thinking and planning when they're playing against their fans or they're playing against the competitors. It's more immersive. Obviously, you know, anyone can be part of this. You know, I, uh, as a, as a, you know, I'm some, I, I wish I can play uh, um, basketball like um, LeBron James, but given I'm a little bit of a challenge, I can't, but I can be an amazing immersive player on a, on a NBA K2 and play that game in esports. And that's the reality. You can be people you want to be. And last but not the least, it's super exciting. Um, I got, you know, at the end of this presentation, I might share with you guys a video which actually show you it is huge. You get biggest DJs, biggest wall people come in, actually create that buzz around. So just a very quick update on the esports. Um, I think we're now going to go into from memory and a panel. Over to you, Poppy. Thank you. Just wait for everyone's faces to pop up. Ashley, Lance, thank you so much. Um, so we are, we've got Ricky, Lance um, from Mad Colony, um, Ash joining us today to just break down some myths on gaming and give their perspective on some of the trends that we're, we're seeing now in um, this really exciting space that is really now mainstream more than anything. So Lance, let's kick off with you um, and let's discuss gaming genres, ad types and content suitability. Great topic to start with. Um, so marketers, there's an ex ex implicit belief that marketers that develop pre-campaign strategies running ads around and within high quality gaming environments will produce the most powerful results for their brands. Can you provide an example into the impact of ad creative and how the end user positively and negatively perceives brand recognition? What are some of the actionable insights that you're seeing, please? Hey, Poppy. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> and I think I'm going to give uh, one, one of the boring answers because I think the first thing that we need to realize that, you know, gaming is no longer a niche channel. Uh, and it's quite interesting to see the results that Cantor got because uh, we use Global Web Index data, uh, who releases a report every quarter, uh, panel 4,000. And the data from Q1 that they saw is, you know, it's close to 80% of Australians that uh, game on any device on a regular basis. And that is across pretty much every audience. So if you look at, you know, Gen X or, you know, people that were born in the olden days that my son that seven says, uh, you know, 77% of them game uh, on any device. You look at mums with, with kids living at home, 76% uh, <clears throat> of them game, uh, game on a regular basis. So the, the general terminology of a gamer is, is quite obsolete. You know, the same way as, you know, we don't talk about a watcher or a reader because everybody watches and, and everybody games. So, uh, you know, doing specific creatives can sometimes hamper brands as well. So, you know, yeah. you look at TV campaigns, you don't create a TV ad to reach a TV watcher. Uh, you know, you, the majority of campaigns that run on social media are not targeting social media fans. So I think it's more important to look at the characteristics of that environment. Yeah. So if you take what Ad Colony does, which is, uh, you know, mobile gaming, um, you know, again, Moms is a big audience for mobile gaming. And the, one of the main formats there is a, you know, full screen video format, uh, which is in HD. So looking at that environment, then, you know, the ad that you are running on uh, catch up TV or, you know, the ad that you're running on, on YouTube will work uh, just as well in that, uh, in that platform. So I think it's, it's important to understand that, you know, how, do you, how do you how do you inform brands on on that content environment and the audience that suits that content environment to ensure that you're developing positive um, or or positive brand recognition? Is um, that is that something that the marketers brands are aware of? Um, I think you know the, the sheer size of gaming is something that it's the market is sort of waking up to. So um, both me and Ricky presented to. Uh, a uh, fashion brand uh, yesterday and and it, their main audience is you know females 18 to, to 29 so interrogating the data from global web index we looked up 
um, females 18, 29 that in the last three months have purchased um, products from their, from their store, 82% of those uh, were mobile gamers. So again, you know, talking specifically to that audience as gamers is again, kind of obsolete. Uh, and yeah. of course there are ways that you can do, um, you know, if you're targeting casual gamers as an example, so that's people that play things like Candy Crush, which is three in a row, people that do um, puzzle games, trivia games. If you identify that your particular audience is into that and obviously building a playable unit that is, you know, a mini puzzle game uh, will obviously drive up the engagement. So there are tactical things that you can do um, yeah. Just in the same way as um, if you know the game Among Us that blew up uh, during the pandemic, which yeah. is a game about um, basically anyone with kids. Anyone with kids might be playing that with their kids. Yeah, my son was obsessed with it. I didn't really get it. <laughs> but you know, you, you look at that game, and the, the premise of the game is to there's there's a, a bunch of people on a spaceship, uh, and one person is an imposter, and that person needs to kill everyone uh, without getting caught. So uh, it's all about finding the imposter. So we pitched uh, one of the big uh, burger chains has an imposter burger because it's a burger that's, uh, you know, made not, not from me. So, you know, those kind of tactical references you can do, but I think it's really about looking at the environment. So again, looking at the stuff that Ricky and Twitch are doing is, you know, yeah. amazing stuff, but it's very much built on that environment, what the platform does, how people interact in that platform. But it's very hard to just go, you know, this is how you engage with gamer because essentially everybody is a gamer. And you, and we're going to lead into Ash soon uh, because he's a great game developer. So we want to understand those motivations from a from a gamer perspective. But lastly, on that question, the actionable insights that you then go back and and look at to review the success uh, or the power of of that creative within that content. What what are you what do you see what what do you show back to your clients? Is it uplift up, uplift studies? What have you got there? Uh, so, I mean, if we if we look at mobile gaming, which which again is a big part of what we do, uh, it's very similar to to traditional advertising campaigns. So you know we run brand uplift studies. Uh, we do uh, you know footfall attribution if it's a campaign to drive you know visits to stores. Uh, so. It's very, very similar to to traditional campaigns, I'd say. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ash, over to you. And we mentioned earlier you are a game developer, and we will keep out the advertising part of, <laughs> of your personality. Yeah. Um, if I was a marketer coming to you to navigate gaming and the related opportunities, so for example, custom games or brand integrations into existing games, what are some uh, trends that are taking shape that you would recommend back? Please. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting because you've got Twitch that advertises around people playing gameplay and then, um, you know, Lance's advertising in games. But a level above that can be, you know, create, a brand can create their own custom game, you know, that, that lives on at the top end, a console or lives on your, on your phone. Um, and there's been uh, brands that have done that successfully. I think uh, even KFC. In the US, made a, made a dating game that was, um, you know, quite popular from both a press angle, but actually gamers enjoyed it. Um, and, and, and then you've got to oh, be yeah. clear on that. Sorry to interrupt. That that KFC example that that's essentially yeah. a game being created specifically for KFC, and then that just lives there, right? It doesn't go yeah. away. Yeah, I think that that's been one of the trends is to think outside of like a campaign window. Um, you know, you know, it's like oh, we've got a three month campaign. If you're doing you know, a game, if you're making a custom game or custom integration, you can live past that. You know, it's like, well, what's think above a campaign and more at a brand level. So that KFC game still on um, Steam now, still getting millions of downloads a year, and it was released a couple of years ago. So that, that's one thing is to just think outside of just a campaign window. Um, and then I think uh, Lance or um, Ricky kind of touched on like the Twitch stuff is very custom integration and that promotional side of things. I think that's another interesting part. Like if you can't go to the level of creating a game. Do something really integrated with an existing game that's already out there that has a great mm -hmm. audience um, among us. You know, if you could do a partnership with them, but like, uh, there's a lot of games like you know Jam City and um, those ones allow those kind of custom integrations, um, and they can align with your brand but also your audience as well. Fashion, cars, um, luxury items, and stuff. Those ones lend themselves really well to those kind of integrations because yeah. they're already in into the game. And then you've got your um, 
you know, kind of in-game ads and around game ads. But I think the the one thing for brands to think about is that you can go to the top level. We can create our own game, have it on the, the app stores, which is the lowest barrier to entry, and and have that be a destination where people would actually actively seek it out and share it. So I think a lot of times if you spend all your money creating an ad, it's useless until you've then got media money to spend to promote it. Whereas if you can create a, your own game or, you know, actual entertaining property, um, people will actively seek that out. And any media you spend on that will have a, you know, a much higher multiple because people yeah. will play it for longer. So yeah. I think there's a lot of, lot of interest there, um, a lot of interesting opportunities there above just, you know, running ads in and around games, but actually being part of the gameplay. From a from a gaming developer developer perspective, there is the um, end user motivation and retention. Um, yeah. So, when when you're thinking about that and talking to your brand, what are maybe explain some common topics of resistance that you're seeing coming from the clients or even coming from the the developer side? Um, you know, and how can you how can you unify that and and you know achieve some great outcomes for the advertiser. Yeah, I think the, the biggest barrier would be timeframes, whereas, you know, game development takes a while. So if, if, again, if you're only thinking like, I need something, I need it in one month and I want it to live for one month, um, you know, a, a very small short or three months, a short campaign, that would just be too quick and for a lot of developers. Um, yeah. And then also it has to have a, you know, a good brand integration it has to be, you know, gamers are quite simple and I, I'm using gamers as a term, but, you know, when you see, advertising, you know, it's almost like product placement, you know, you're going to have a little bit of a cynicism, but if it actually integrates really well, you know, the Bond films do this well, where, you know, the car is part of the film, then you, you're much more accepting for it, accepting to it. So I think it's, you know, find an integration that works really well um, and think outside of a very short time frame, And, and then that, that's where you could have, you can remove some of the barriers where it's like, Hey, I'm, I'm thinking long-term, I want to be, I want to actually enhance the game or I want to give value, you know, um, using fashion as an example, there's a lot of games where you have to either, um, you know, dress up your character or your avatars. And so if you gave away a fashion item that they would normally pay for, but as part of your launch or integration, then that's a, value, that's a great value added to the, to the value exchange to the player. So not only are they getting that brand integration, but they're getting something of value that they normally would have paid for. So I think those ones are quite powerful. And also you, we were, we were chatting last night and you also mentioned that the, the gamer, the, the gamer is quite cynical or not. Um, and so an advertiser should really be quite mindful about what they're running within that environment during gameplay. Yeah, I think, I mean, Lance said that your, your TV ad will work on, on, on the phone and it will technically work. But I think if you, like all good advertising, if you're more contextually aware of the, the place that you're advertising in, um, it can be more powerful. So, you know, if, especially with digital ads, you know, you, you know the kind of frequency or the, the amount of times they've seen it. So for me as a gamer, if, I, if I've seen the same ad over and over again, I'll, I'll zone out. And you actually probably got the, more of their attention because on TV, when an ad comes on, you go, I go straight to my phone. Whereas when I'm on my phone playing, like, I'll sit through and watch it. So if you know that they've seen this ad three, four times, you know, mix it up with a different, you know, a slightly different message yes. um, or, or creative and, and, and consider that, you know, like, okay, this is what they'll see over the first, second, third, fourth time. Yeah. And if you can be contextually aware, like, if I'm advertising, you know, I think the only TV I really watch is the Lego Masters show and half the ads on there are, are aware that they're on a Lego show. And so they actually advertise the fact that, hey, it's a Honda Civic, but it's made out of Lego and it's really interesting, you know, more interesting than just a normal car. So car ad. So if you're advertising in a game and you know what game you're advertising in because you've got a big spend on a, a big title, be, being contextually aware of that, or if you're on Twitch, being contextually aware that you're in Twitch can really like break down that, you know, that um, advertising blindness or, you know, advertising cynicism that yeah. everyone has and being like, yeah. oh, what? They know that I'm on Switch? Like, oh, that's that's interesting versus just a copy and paste um, commercial. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's more um, work involved in that, but I think you know, you consider that. Just to jump in there, I, I do agree with you, Ash, that obviously contextually relevant is, is more powerful. Uh, that it, it was more to kind of explain that, you know, you can run the basics, yeah. uh, but I definitely agree. And I think one thing that's interesting is when, when you look, you know, there are a big majority of gamers that don't consider themselves gamers that, you know, they don't, it's not part of their passion point. But when you look at people that are passionate gamers, so, you know, I've been gaming for 35 years, you know, my dad was a technophile. I had Pong when I was little. So I identify as a gamer and 
you know, even though gaming is so large, people that are passionate gamer, we still consider ourselves as a kind of subculture. Mm -hmm. So when brands, you know, speak to them specifically on Twitch and, and you can tell the brand is making an effort, you know, research and studies are showing that they're far more receptive to sponsored content. They're far more receptive to ads because again, we see ourselves as a little subculture, even though we've that, you know, even though gaming is such a uh, mass reach channel now. Yeah. And, and you have to think about the end user motivations, the psychology of, of that gaming. You might not be a hardcore gamer, but you are motivated by the rewards. So going to, back to that contextual discussion, it's not necessarily contextual 1986 contextual. We're talking about a more nuanced, um, innovative trends of the audience and understanding the, the end gamer. So, you know, if you're a if you're a um, mid core player, you're you're motivated by you know developing your skills and your strategy, and how can that ad creative then, you know, supplement that that game experience, that gameplay? Yeah, and I think talk to it. You know, I've seen a lot of ads now where it's like, hey, you know, like the YouTube aware ones, like YouTube uh, pre, uh, True View, like you know, you, you can skip this in five seconds. I'll give you my message. You know, I've seen a lot of uh, cinema chains. You know preloading their trailer five seconds of basically just tell it gives the whole trailer in five seconds and then hopes that you want to watch the whole thing so i think those are really good examples where as you're planning your creative just think okay how if this is going to be if this is going to be spent on gaming or twitch can we do something creatively interesting there if you can't that's fine but at least have a think about it very early on so yeah. when you're shooting the shooting the creative or creating it you can just have that little bit of contextual so it's like all right here's our 15 second here's our 15 second for twitch here's one for you here's our pre-roll for youtube and here's the one for mobile gaming rewarded ad. And they all just have a slight different message. Um, I think that's just being contextually aware of that. And, and what, yeah, like what those motivations are. Okay, they're sitting on, their, they're sitting on their, their phone and they're waiting for that 30 seconds so they get the reward. Is yeah. that something as a stimulus for the creative to, to have a, um, you know, a fun message? Um, well, that so I think leads nicely. Sorry, that leads nicely into into Ricky now because I think what we really need to do here, Ricky, is rewind back a bit and clarify up front the different gaming genres attract that different gaming genres attract and motivate different end users. So, for example, uh, the major difference between a hyper casual mobile gamer who's playing Candy Crush versus a mid core player who plays Clash of Clans those end users are going to be motivated differently and those gaming genres are going to attract different audiences. Can you please help break down this with some ex explicit examples you're seeing across Twitch? Yeah, sure. Um, look, I think uh, I was just listening to both Lance and Ash and the conversation. I think the next time when we do this uh, webinar, instead of calling gamers, we should just call it 25 to 54, 18 to 34, because I think uh, that whole word gamer is probably needs to go away and then just treat us as people and, and audience and, and, and humans. They're calling it um, end user. End user is yeah, a good one. End user, <laughs> yep, call it whatever gamer. It just sounds like, oh, it's, it doesn't need to be. Um, look, it's a great question. And as a kind of touch base to you, I think the variety in gaming industry is huge. You know, if you're a movie buff, you obviously have your own choice. You're the rom-com, you're action, you are comedy, your drama, Sam goes for sports, nothing different in gaming. In gaming, there's so many different variants. You got the horror, you got the first person shooting, you got the um, RPG. So there's different type of and people are coming into based on their own on category and their own liking. And that's going to continue. At Twitch, we we sort of the, the audience segmentation, which we consider is based on three. And that's again based on the spectatorship and also what we see um, and the, the data we get from gaming publication. We break it down into three audience. One is casual gamers. These are the people who are time poor, used to be gamers back in the day. Maybe take Lance as an example because he's still gaming, but you know, they used to be a big gamers back in the day, but they're just a little bit time poor and they 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 want to be across gaming, but they can't because whatever the case, they come onto to our service and they watch other people game. So they are the casual gamers. The second part we call them the conventional gamers. They tend to be playing it themselves, they, they have their own time, they will have you know maybe weekends when maybe groups go through, but they they just want to be around they want to know what's happening and they will go buy from e eb games or whatnot and be across that 
And the last, the biggest bucket, which Andrea kind of also touched, is the gaming fanatics. This is their DNA. They want to be empowered. They are your cousins or your friends or family at the barbecue telling you to buy that game because they're playing it. They are front. They are FOMO factor. So the way we obviously see is not just category level, but we also see audience segments. Um, and there's varies or different people who game uh, or, or just be spectators of the game, if that can answer your question. Yeah, that's perfect. And and Mark, uh, from your perspective, um, cause marketers are, you know, I think they're quite aware. We've moved into mainstream now with gamers. Are they aware of the different type of gaming audiences that they can select for the environments? And are they creating the creative to suit that in genre and the audience? Yeah, I think Ash touched base on this, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's some really savvy marketeers who are really coming into this and, and really taking on, you know, a lot of, lot of other clients, you know, Nikes, pop cultures are going, I want to partner with this, um, uh, this streamer or I'll partner with this gamer and I want to create something really exciting. But at the same time, I also believe what Lance just said, you know, for Twitch, we are an entertainment led service so don't just go we don't have a gaming creative we're not going to be um uh, uh, you know a big part of it use this as a exposure strategy broadcasting strategy because let's be very honest but you know this this audience which ash kind of mentioned he he doesn't watch this free to air so if you're trying to get ash on a one plus frequency which is a tv native you will you probably end up spending a frequency of 15 plus on perhaps someone who's a heavy tv girl. so you need to use these interesting uh, uh, lances, myself and other things as a broadcasting channel just to get exposure of your brand out. I'm just reading um, the chat here from Simon Slee saying that uh, these users are not just tied to one type of um, gaming genre. They, they flip between three to five and um, they play multiple genres. So um, a crossing over from casual to midcore and back again. So. Um, depending on their moods. I'd love to maybe next time explore how you capture that audience in terms of the marketing and the creative that, um, that you know, we, we, uh, that, that marketers need to think about. So great point there. Um, Lance, we're back to you. Um, we're going to look at, and we've touched, the, touched on this already, there's in-game, um, creative, in-game, around the game, playable ads, rewarded videos, interstitials, banners, just to name a few ad creatives available within gaming and across devices. What are some factors that marketers can consider as they architect their ad types um, around content that might improve the end user experience? For example, how can marketers minimize interruption to the user gameplay flow? We've got a nice yeah. example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, again, back to uh, again what Ricky said that you know, first and foremost, it's it, it's a broadcast channel. Uh, but there are tactics that you can deploy. Um, and just to show an example, so um, one area of gaming that is evolving rapidly is um, actual in-game ads. So that's the ability to insert an ad into the actual gameplay. So if you think a racing game or a sports game or an open world game where you would have a, a billboard, you can actually dynamically insert an ad. And that has historically been um, quite challenging because you had to hard code uh, the ad into the game, which is you know costly, it was hard to measure. But now technology has evolved and you're able to dynamically insert them. Uh, you, know, you can measure your viewability, you can measure impressions, your uniques, you can, you know, on, on mobile devices, you can apply uh, targeting, you know, you can measure for, for fraud, etc. Uh, so just to show uh, an example of a campaign that we ran here with uh, 7-Eleven. So if we can... And Lars has been teasing us with this case study. So we're very grateful that we, that we got the approval. So if we look at this... Uh, So 
Are we back? Yeah, so this, back. Yep, this is an example um, of a campaign that we ran with, with 7-Eleven. And uh, Stephanie, my, uh, my, my, my colleague, is not very good at that game, uh, as you probably saw. But um, basically, you know, we call it virt virtual out of home. Uh, so this was 7-Eleven, uh, uh, you know, wanting to tap into the, their audience, the, you know, realize their audience play a lot of games. Um, and, you know, had a compelling message, you know, who doesn't want a Slurpee for a buck? Uh, but as you can see, the, the, the creative was more uh, adjusted for that type of format. So just like out of home, you know, you can't have two, two of an intricate message in there. You know, it has to be a clear, big, visual, very simple message, you know, Slurpee, uh, Slurpee one dollar. Um, you got to adjust for the format that, you know, it's not, it's not a clickable format. It's more top of the funnel. And looking at the results of this campaign, uh, we also ran a footfall study on this campaign. Uh, so we saw uh, increase in brand lift, but the, you know, the main thing is that we saw uh, on the exposed group, 173% visit lift. So in fact, it actually drove pe people that saw it, it drove people into 7-Eleven store buying a Slurpee. And the reason for that is, you know, the attention on it was really high uh, because yeah. the format is within the actual game, uh, you know, a few abilities sat at 95%, uh, you know, which is quite high for a, for a display unit. And then the fact that you, you're, you're, you know, you're hitting the right audience that, that you're looking for. So, so again, you know, looking at this type of format, I believe um, at some point, you know, if you're an omnipresent brand, like you're a Coke or you're a McDonald's that needs to be seen everywhere. If you are not present within gaming or within virtual worlds, uh, people that game a lot are not going to perceive you as an omnipresent brand. Hmm. But, you know, this correct, but also we also have to be mindful of the end user and, and the, the game, the gameplay flow and minimize the interruption. So, you know, if, if, if you went and ran that in a hardcore game, that's not exactly going to, that's not going to sit well, right? Um, I, I would tend to disagree. It depends on what you do, uh, because I think if you take like a game like Call of Duty, as an example, you know, the, the objective of games is to mimic the real world as much as possible. So, you know, mm. when I was playing sports game when I was young, I would see a fake uh, soda ad in the game. So as a gamer, if you see a real ad, it's actually mimicking the real world. So it's actually enhancing the experience. And, and, and we see these in, uh, we've done studies and looked at, you know, people's perception of it. So they actually, it enhances the experience. Uh, it's obviously very non-intrusive because it's just in and around the gameplay. And it has, you know, carries really high attention because, again, you know, you, you, you're right in the visual field. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, Ash, oh, yeah. Oh, can I say, like, I think in the background, those ones are, are very acceptable, like Lance said. I think that the issue I've seen is when they're both in the background and interstitially, uh, breaking up gameplay. I think that happened with the UFC game where, which was a pay yeah, game, so exactly. people have already paid free, free games. You can do whatever you want because no one's paying anything. But exactly. uh, for UFC, it was I paid sixty dollars or eighty dollars. I'm playing the game, and then I get ads in between, um, like making me wait for gameplay. So that's where it's a big no. But if, and, if you're in a free game environment and in the background like that, I think um, again, gamers are much more like. Wow, I don't have to sit through fifteen seconds or thirty seconds. Like, well, I mean, that that's an important point, which leads us into our next question, Ash, about creating those genuinely positive ad moments, um, and how and and maintaining the end user motivation to avoid interruption to the gameplay. So you you just touched on that rewarded versus non rewarded interstitial. Do you think the end user understands the value exchange? Do they think you know, and and also the juxtaposition? Sort of juxtaposition of that, you know, that creative in an environment that might not suit. Can you get into a little bit of depth around that? Uh, I mean, I'm always surprised how little uh, people in general know about how advertising works. Uh, you know, I, I'd assume that they realize that, you know, a rewarded ad is paying for the content that, that they're playing. Um, so I mean, it really, really depends. But again, for me, like I would be, if I knew that this was a rewarded ad, I would try and make reference to that in the creative, the fact that, you know, hey, um, you know, you've only got to wait 30 seconds to get, to get the reward. Like that would at least, um, you know, have a wink and a nod to the, to the player. Um, yes. And then I'd also, you know, work with Lance and other, other networks to say like, I don't want to be the fourth ad they see in their game session. I want to be one of the first. So I've got a more, um, you know, I'm the first ad that they've waited for, not that, Oh, sorry, on the first ad, sorry, not the fourth or fifth, because when you're playing a lot of these games, you might, you might see a lot of ads as well, because 
you you know you constantly in a game loop. So there's a little bit more um you know, the more contextually where you are of where your ads and how it's being shown, the the better you can kind of um you know adjust for that. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's on it's on us as an industry and you know get uh, game developers uh, to to be more educational to players to to know why they're seeing certain things. And I think. I think Twitch has, you know, this 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 is a sponsored message that people realize, like, oh, the person that I'm enjoying watching them play, they're getting money for this, so you know, they don't feel as bad about that. So yeah. I, it's a slow, it's a slow, um, gradual thing there. But for me, it would be if you can be contextual about it, or you know, knowing that, that this is the fourth time you've seen this ad, change it up. So and make reference to the fourth time you've seen it, or you know, mix it up so that you just kind of each time they see your creative, it's a little bit, a little bit fresh. Really and creating that positive ad moment for the brand recognition as well um, yeah. is super yeah. important. I've, I've seen ads where it's like, hey, this is only going to be five seconds because we know you don't want to wait, brought to you by blah, and then it skips. So normally it'd be 15, but this time it was only a five second one. And so I felt good because I was like, wow, they're, they're, not, they're not wasting my time. I think that was on a YouTube mm -hmm. special creator. So, you know, again, those are probably more custom elements, but, you know, it's worth asking those questions as well um, okay. how to break out of the norm. The, the amount of times that we pitch people to make, you know, do some sort of homage to the rewarded zone. So for people that don't know how this works is you're playing a game and you need a boost in the game and you can choose to pay money or you can engage it with an ad. And, you know, we've gone to, you know, insurance company and said, you know, just put it like, you know, need a little bit of help or a little bit of support. Or if, it, you know, if it's a bank in terms of savings, you know, there's, there's so many things you can do. But what's a point I'm trying to make here is we, used to have brands would say we don't want rewarded ads even though all data suggests that that's what consumers prefer because consumers understand the value exchange i can pay for this or i can watch this ad they understand the value exchange because the reality is that normal people that are not in advertising um they don't think about it so for them they go to youtube it's a great site. The only annoying thing is all the ads because they don't connect the dots that youtube is free because there are ads However, mm -hmm. in the rewarded zone, it's so blatantly obvious that I can either pay money to keep playing or pay money yeah. to get that boost. Yeah. But I'll and it goes back to that psychology of the end user and the reward outcome. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're okay. We're, we're running the right creative. I think we're almost out of time. Um, I do want to I do want to jump over to Ricky really quickly um, regarding those case studies that you you presented and and. Um, how you've illustrated the unilateral attention or economy of the end user in this category. Um, if you can just highlight some awesome innovations that are happening in the ecosystem at the moment, I really like what's going on with the influencer um, community. Can you maybe like touch on that a little bit and just talk about some trends um, in maybe a minute? <laughs> Yeah, look, I, I, look, there's so much I can talk talk about on this topic. I'm quite passionate about. You know, I think the innovation coming out is, you know, obviously esports from a from a very interesting thing. You know, you're not just having esports led by that by the by the companies organising. You got esports led by brands. We got a a hot off the press is going to come out tomorrow. One of the biggest CPG brands in Australia is organising their own esports league which we are running. So that's one. Second thing, the innovation is coming in. Brands actually taking part in actual games, which Carl Lanz just mentioned, but is happening in Blasang. Um, you know, um, tourism brands, but also fashion brands are being, being part of, um, you know, if that is a in-game advertising or if there is an in-game, you know, um, the reference landscape about the soda water. We also got on on site so PAX, which is one of the biggest events in Melbourne, happening later this year. There's a big, you know, stuff on 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 sponsorship on all stuff through. And I think we're going to continue seeing this part to go into even more uh, gamers led. So you're going to start seeing movies, Hollywood. You know, you're going to get a lot more uh, uh, movies being made out of the gaming sequences. So I think this area is actually watch this space. I'm super excited about it, and hopefully the advertisers in the room as well. Thank you. That wraps up our um, panel discussion. Thanks to Lance, Ash, Ricky. It's been great chat. Um, over to you, Gay. Thanks, everyone. I think my favourite line was gamers are people too. It felt very elephant man-ish. So um, thank you for that. Great session. Lots of inspiring. I am feeling like a Slurpee now. Um, for those of you, those who can join us for our next webinar. Whoops, I'm going to skip past Lance's video again. 
Um, our next one is looking at search, so slightly different, uh, but an area that's growing. So we're looking at search in the media mix and also the evolving areas of search. So um, commerce, visual search, it, it's sort of changing, changing how it looks and feels. So hopefully some of you can join us for that, that the link's been shared in the chat there.